Hello, everybody. Welcome to Rationable Interviews. And today we have, as usual, a very, very special guest, someone who has completely, well, not altered the, the way I think about discussing things with people who have completely different beliefs, but has definitely connected me with a way of speaking and a way of discussion, which has become the foundation of what Rationable is. Everything I've been doing with Rationable is essentially to talk about rationality with humility, with respect, with and a genuine interest in understanding what the other person is saying. And all of that has come primarily from Peter Bogosian, who wrote the Manual for Creating Atheists and How to Have Impossible Conversations. That was the foundational structure. But... Anthony Magnabosco has been the person who has put all of those ideas into practice and has gone out on the streets and talked to many people, people from varying religions and belief systems with conspiracy theory beliefs, even as well as even atheists to understand how they get their beliefs and if their the source of their belief or the way that they come to their belief is a reliable way to come to a truth, essentially. I'm sure Anthony would be able to phrase that a hell of a lot better than me. <laughs> so uh, please join me in welcoming Anthony Magnabosco. Anthony, thank you so much for joining me today. Thanks for having me, Ab Abhijit. I really appreciate talking with you, especially because your channel seems to be centered around having good, productive, rational conversations. So it sounds like it's going to be a good fit, a good discussion. Exactly. So I, I've this is, in short... Rational is about being nice. And <laughs> that's something that social media is, is sorely lacking these days. There is way too much hatred and outrage and other nonsense that keeps rolling on. But I've always been a pacifist. I've always tried to kind of tone situations down. So the first few years of me becoming an atheist and a skeptic was primarily informed with watching people like Christopher Hitchens, David Silverman, Richard Dawkins, talking to religious people and uh, science deniers, etc. And they are, I mean, I wouldn't say firebrand, but they're definitely very aggressive in their way, in their approach, especially during debates and other conversations. They're very in your face. And as much as that feels good to watch, I mean, the hitch slap is still resonating across YouTube as we speak. But your approach and I mean, which has been put forward by Peter Bogosian and you what you've put into practice has been has it changed the entire conversation. It changed the way I viewed these kinds of conversations. So and of course, the term is street epistemology. So could you tell us a little bit more about what exactly is street epistemology? Yeah, sure. And I, th I think the way that you framed it as sort of a contrast from an aggressive approach is really the the right way to start because street epistemology is by its nature, I think, more civil. Now, civil or friendly doesn't necessarily mean you just let people walk all over you and it's it's about finding middle ground and it's about agreeing to disagree. Let me disabuse people of that notion. We're still interested in the truth and and holding people to to have good justifiable reasons for thinking that something is true to a high degree of confidence. So, but uh, yeah, I, th I think, I think the SE approach is, is quite appealing to people who don't want to argue or don't want to be as caustic as you might see with the Hitchens or, or Dawkins, et cetera. I, I think that those approaches have their place. We can probably Absolutely. get into that if you want, but yeah, so street epistemology started with Dr. Peter Bogosian in his books. Like you mentioned, I discovered them around 2013 and then was excited about it because I was using the Dawkins Hitchens aggressive approach in your face. Let me give you facts. Let me even ridicule you and thinking that that was going to make a difference. And of course, if, if, if anyone ever tries those approaches, you might get lucky and you might actually find the one thing that they would find convincing that changes their mind, but more than likely that approach is going to dig them in even deeper. So that's, that's what I found appealing about street epistemology is that it's, it's, uh, it's about taking yourself out of it and about exploring how somebody else became convinced by 
by the reasoning that brought them to their conclusion. It's exploring their reasoning with them by mm -hmm. asking questions. That's essentially what street epistemology is. It's not about my reasoning. It's about your reasoning. It's not about my claims or confidence. It's about your claims or confidence. And that's a real shift from the way that we typically see atheists engage with theists about their religious beliefs. We're yeah. usually arguing with them. We're usually ridiculing and giving them, them facts. So this was a discovering street epistemology around that time was a real eye opener for me. And it, it was a total game changer. And I, we also quickly realized that this technique, this tool, these set of tools can be used to explore all different types of claims besides just religion. So there's a utility to it. There's, there's, dare I say, even an effectiveness to it, although we don't have data to back that up just yet, but we're working on it. Oh, what are you working on? How do you get data for these things? Well, well, we formed a nonprofit organization in 2019. And one of our objectives was to find somebody willing to, to study the effectiveness of street epistemology. And we've been working with a researcher out of Germany for almost a year now to develop a methodology for testing SE. And we're very, very close to running a pilot just to make sure that our, our methodology is functioning and we're capturing data. And then we're going to be looking for people like yourself to help us propagate the word about this study so that we can run lots and lots of people through it. And maybe oh, finally oh. we can have some data. And even if this study doesn't exactly do what we hope that it does, we think that it will probably open up the door for more studies. People are very interested in belief revision and what it takes to change people's minds and help them reflect, especially in today's day and age where we're arguing with each other all the time. Yeah, and so people like me, very who, needed. science communicators, atheist activists, skeptic activists, we all kind of, we want to know what that secret is <laughs> to be able to change people's minds or at least understand where people's beliefs come from so that they can be challenged in a respectful way because i mean that's where that that's the golden chalice no the holy grail <laughs> so to speak that is the holy grail of science communication and skeptical activism because i'd be very excited to figure that out please let me know when that's when that's going down absolutely yeah because you can only show so many videos or talk about so many anecdotal experiences uh, us being skeptics, we want to have data to show that this works or not. And I think that I think that this approach is effective. We just need to have some data to show it. And I and I think what will happen is once we do have some studies under our belts, I think we will start to to catch the attention of science communicators. We're already ca catching their attention now. So there's a real lack of understanding uh, about how to present information to people in a way that they'll accept it. And uh, yeah, I suspect that once once we have some data under our belts, it will it will allow us to enter some new fields and grow this even further. Oh, absolutely. I, I'm dying to know. But I'm I so today I do want to give people like a toolkit that they can use to start off on that journey towards in street epistemology. At least give people a kind of a and I'm not saying that you go into detail because of course books have been written about this but if you could in as brief and systematic a way as possible kind of put forward the kind of process one goes through to go through this conversation just to give people those basic tools that they can use in their everyday conversations with people with their friends with their families i would love to be able to give them that that, that little toolbox that they can at least start with. Would you do the honors? I'd be happy to, and I'll keep it really simple. Mm -hmm. And there, that we have, we have, we're actually in the process of developing a self-directed course to teach people how to do this. And we've blown this out into like seven or eight steps, but I'll just keep it real simple, like three high level steps. Mm -hmm. uh, if you want to explore a claim somebody makes that they think is true. And by the way, you can actually apply these same tools to your own claims. Although I think it's and, useful if somebody's, if somebody's doing it to you, or yeah. at least with you, you'll probably get a higher quality exploration if somebody is doing this with you, but mm -hmm. a high level just try to think of try to think of your conversation the path is going what why how what exactly is the claim that they're making do i understand the words that they're using and how sure are they that this is true on a scale from 0 to 10 or 0 to 100 what exactly is your claim let me totally understand it cuz I, I if i don't understand what your claim is then how can we actually proceed so try to work out that second step Figure out their main reason why they think their claim is true. What is your biggest reason that gives you the most confidence that this claim is true? Now, sometimes people don't have reasons for thinking that their claim is true, but more often than not, 
they'll give you a reason. Now, it may not, it may be the reason that just came into their mind. <laughs> it's not a very well thought out reason, but in any case, it doesn't matter. You want to kind of figure out what is the reason that's propping up their confidence, because then you, then you can actually move on to the third step, which is the how. How did you conclude that that's a good reason? What process did you use to test that reason to be so sure that your claim is true? So just very high level, there's, what is it that you believe? What's your biggest reason for thinking that this is true? And then how did you determine that that's a good reason? That's roughly the path of an SC conversation. Wrapped around that is good, strong, genuine rapport. I want to be honest with you. I want to reveal to you what my goals are, if I have any. If my goal is to change your mind, I should probably disclose that to you even though it might make you a little bit more guarded. That's a hotly contested topic in the SE community, <laughs> by the way, if we should be doing that or not. But but I think you should reveal what you're up to. And I think that that builds trust and leads to just more genuine rapport. If, if you have good rapport and you follow that what, why, how, and mm -hmm. you ask genuine questions to really understand your conversation partner and give them time to think, more than likely, they're going to begin to realize that there's there's gaps in their reasoning. Uh, and those gaps, the recognition of those gaps is what tends to, this is a hypothesis, the recognition of those gaps is what tends to move people off of their their current degree of confidence. Mm -hmm. We tend to meet a, a lot of overconfident people in their conclusions. They're so sure the earth is flat or that this vaccine is good or harmful. And it's the exploration of these beliefs that in that manner that mm -hmm. tends to give people pause and help them reflect. And it's that self-reflection about their own reasoning that tends to shift people in their confidence. And we've seen this time and time again, and it seems to work. And uh, it's like discovering plutonium or something. It's, I, I, do, I, th <laughs> I think that this is an amazing thing, yeah. but we, we need to simplify it. We need to make it more commonplace. And I think we need to try to shift the culture to make this more acceptable, this type of questioning. Absolutely. Because otherwise you're just pushing people away. And like I used to, like when I first realized I was an atheist. Now, 99% of the content out there, which is a challenging religious beliefs, at least, was regarding Christianity. Because right now, Christianity is the most tolerant, relatively speaking, of religions when it comes to being criticized. And when I came back to India, I was in the UK at the time when this happened. And when I came back to India, I started talking with my Catholic sister-in-law. And I honestly, looking back, I thought I was being very nice. <laughs> but there were, there were many times when she, I could make out that she was getting agitated. But over many conversations, we kind of, I think I kind of, I also ended up softening. And I also ended up kind of understanding the reasons why she believed regardless of changing her level of confidence that that wasn't my goal but it was a very interesting experience and a learning experience for sure can you take me through a little bit more about what were your experiences initially just after you had deconverted as seth andrews tends to put it yeah when i deconvert well i don't know if i it's hard to say it's hard to say what i did was deconversion because <laughs> I don't think, I don't think I really ever believed it. Oh, okay. like at a, at a, at a really young age, I just was questioning it. I, maybe nine, 10. I remember my parents being really agitated because I didn't want to go to church and I didn't think it was real. And I was the oldest of four kids. And I think that they were concerned about how that might impact the other kids. So I was really forced to go to church, but the whole time, and even going through the later things. I was also raised Catholic. So you might yeah. recognize some of these terms like communion and confirmation. Yeah. I went through all of that stuff, not really believing it, but I didn't really think that much about it until getting married. So I didn't have a deconversion. I just sort of had a recognition that I had deconverted. Ah. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. And it was that same thing, kind of. Hmm. And it was that recognition that, that I don't know what happened. I, a, 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 a switch flipped in my brain and I immediately went on the attack on social media. So if you, if you, for anyone that wants to go through my Facebook page at my very early posts were very antagonistic towards family members who were religious. Uh -huh. So I lashed out because I recognized how problematic these beliefs were and how easily people can fall for them and how 
how despicable it is. People are getting taken advantage of because of these beliefs. Let's face it. At least that's how, that's how I see it. So I immediately lashed out and I was using a combative, aggressive, ridiculing approach. Ah. So when I discovered Peter's book, who was, who purported that there's this different way of talking with people that was appealing to me because it, it's not even really in my nature to be aggressive. <laughs> I got, in mm -hmm. retrospect, like I, I feel sick that I, that I was that aggressive with my family and friends and, and I've been trying to make up for it ever since, but so I'll never go back to that approach, but yeah, discovering the SE approach was really instrumental in, in shifting my conversations towards more productive being more productive and more, more civil and more respectful and, 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 and frankly, you know, getting more, getting more stuff done. We were making much more progress that way. Absolutely. So, yeah. And weirdly enough, like I just right now thinking about it, the, the manual for creating atheists as being that huge, big sticker on the cover, at least it looks like a sticker. I find that like now that I'm thinking about it, that's that's genius in the way that I mean, it sounds very ugh, like, I mean, from this from the SE perspective, it sounds way too blatant and crass, but it really appeals to the people who have that frustration within where, where they've just come out of their religious beliefs, maybe they're being harassed by their families, maybe they just want other people to understand them, or even like as whenever whenever we learn something new, we would just want to go around and tell everybody about it that I'm an atheist. Like I recently at a at an uh, atheist conference I was speaking at in Pune in India, I said that there is a joke about this. Like, how do you know a person is an atheist? He will tell you. <laughs> so uh, it, the book did appeal. The, the the book did appeal to me. the The appearance of it, the title, and it, and it, yeah, like it it cut through the noise and it got my attention. And in retrospect, honestly, the title is very problematic because it gives <laughs> the impression. Number one, it gives the impression that you could only use this approach for as an atheist talking to a theist, and that's ridiculous. You could use it exactly. for anything, and it also belays it. it it's it's also problematic, I guess, because it suggests that that we're right and you're wrong. Exactly. And I need to get you to my, to my side. And that type of closed mindedness is actually problematic. We we want to be open minded to to the views that we're hearing, even if they sound kind of crazy. So in in hindsight, I think the title of that book in particular is kind of set S E back and might. It might always be one of those things that we, we have to explain because of the title of the book. There, yeah. you, you're almost set back from the start. Fortunately, yeah. the the title of the second book was much better and broader in scope, How to Have Impossible Conversations. Awesome title. Exactly. But that title broke through the noise and caught my attention and the attention of lots of other people. And here we are today. So maybe we wouldn't actually be here if it didn't have that caustic title and it wasn't aimed at atheists to use this with theists. Exactly. Maybe SE is actually stronger and more powerful and potent because it was it was initially launched at such a controversial topic yeah so we, we may actually be, be further along because of because of the way it was initially presented it's hard to say yeah i know I, I, honestly for i mean i've been a marketing guy for most of my career so when i look at that it's a genius marketing move because you are talking to the target audience you're trying to draw them in and say okay well, there's a better way to do this but you know that but that frustration is just it's everywhere. It's almost in every conversation. And I, I still have it even now when I'm speaking with conspiracy theorists or you know, other people who are going into a rant or something of that sort on my Facebook page or on my Telegram community. But so does that, does that, that, that frustration and kind of that anger build up inside you while you're having these conversations still, or has that died down over the years? I would love to say that I don't get triggered at all by overhearing nonsense. And I, I still do. I literally, I have to r literally remind myself of my goals and the, the end result of lashing out in order to stay calm. In fact, we're, we're putting together a manual, not a manual, a manual we're putting, well, I guess you can call it a manual. We're putting together a guide to teach people how to do street epistemology. And that's such a common thing. How do you stay calm? How do you, how do you not get triggered when you hear these things? And there's there's some techniques that you can do, but the more practice, 
the better. But I got to tell you, like I was, I was probably on TikTok earlier this morning, scrolling things and seeing lives going and seeing people saying things and wanting to get in there and just start battling with them. Even today, that still happens. So I don't know if that will ever go away, but I, I, I can tell you that I'm disciplined enough to not do that. In most cases, I can usually set that aside, put myself, put my SE cap on basically and engage in a respectful way. And it usually works out much better when I do it that way. So it's, it, it's that, it's that positive reinforcement afterwards. If you are able to, to keep control of yourself, you get that feedback that this was really the better way to go. And when you do that enough, it just becomes commonplace, but I do still slip into my old ways. <laughs> yeah. I think we all do. I just have to take a deep cleansing breath. Let it out slowly. All right. Next question. <laughs> it's You're a kind of a zen kind of thing, right? You just have to kind of get into a zen kind of mind space and just, just focus. It's fine. It's just yeah. the way to go. It's the, the key thing is to try to take yourself out of it. When, you, when you're exploring somebody's claim, mm -hmm. remind yourself that it's their claim. It's their reasoning that you're exploring. And anything that you bring to it, including your anger yeah. and your emotions, you're going to get in the way of exploring their reasoning. And that's not going to be good for them. And it's probably not going to be good for you or society. So it it uh, it takes some maturity to get past it. But yeah, uh, if you can stay calm, if you can stay calm and use those questions and follow that that path, you're going to have amazing conversations and you're going to help people reflect on their views. Absolutely. I think I hopefully I have managed to do that a couple of times, but most of the time it has been a little bit of a failure, but I'm going to keep, I'm going to keep working on it because usually these things come around as if there are people asking me questions about maybe something that I've posted and they put up, put out a, a kind of a, a claim that, you know, like, and we try to investigate that kind of dig deeper into it, but I still find it extremely hard to refrain myself from just facting that person and just kind of throwing one fact out after the other <laughs> it's really, yeah it is something that yeah. i'm still working on but i'm i'm listening to the audiobook of how to have impossible conversations i'll put the link in the description as well as other amazon links for all these books that we're discussing and so i, I moving on i would like to know like have there has there been a time when you've had some one of your interlocutors kind of has managed to change your mind in some way? It has happened a few times. What typically happens is we'll explore somebody's claim mm -hmm. and then their reasoning and their methodology for confirming the quality of that reasoning. And then the conversation will end and they may ask me where I stand and then we have a discussion and maybe I'll shift there. But what typically happens is I'll go home thinking about what they said mm -hmm. and I'll process presumably what they're doing also they're leaving the conversation and thinking about it afterwards, but I also do the same thing. So I have found myself shifting on certain topics like gun control or abortion, even you name it. I mean, I, I've probably contemplated it and ended up shifting to one degree or the other with regards to the God belief. No, there, I haven't found anything compelling uh -huh. to move from, from my current level of confidence up on the confidence scale that there's a God. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know. I mean, I, I should be able to identify what it would take to move me up. And I, and I yeah. can, <laughs> but I, I haven't seen it yet. And most, in all the arguments that I hear for the existence of a God are very, very poor. I don't find them convincing. Yeah. But yeah. I've, I have moved on some topics for sure. So uh, could, could you uh, tell me a, a little bit more about how you shifted, what, what you used to believe when it came to abortion and how your mind changed? A well, I, I guess that maybe I'm more, I'm more open to the idea that, that this is a life that we're mm -hmm. talking about here. Mm -hmm. Whereas before I might, I might not even use that word life or baby or, or something. I might just go with fetus or, or yeah. a clump of cells or something. So mm -hmm. I think maybe it's kind of forcing me to look a little bit harder at what it, what it is that's actually happening during an abortion. Of course, I still think that the woman has the right to choose and all that. My view, my views on that topic have actually changed as I've gotten older and as I've gotten wealthier, which makes me think that, that, that it's an, that this view, it's, yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know if I want to elaborate too much more on that, but. No, no, that's fine. Don't, yeah. if, don't if you're not comfortable with that, that's totally fine. It's a ridiculously complicated topic, which I think mm -hmm. the politicians in your country have 
really screwed up on. Yeah, our hands full. That's a very hot topic. In fact, I, I, I do the intake interviews for recovering from religion. And one of the questions is to for people to pick a, a topic that they that a controversial topic and what their position is on it, if they can put themselves in the mind of the, of the other person mm -hmm. and invariably 98% of the time, people do pick that topic of abortion. They want to talk about that. That's the one that's on their mind the most. Oh, wow. That is, that's a tough one. I don't, I honestly, like if, if somebody asks me about that, I'm like, it is totally up to the woman. Do not ask me that question. I cannot mm. answer that in any full faith. I just know that whoever has to make the decision is the woman and the women are the ones who should have that decision in their hands. It's not like they're doing it carefree. It is extremely hard for them to go through as well. It's just, it needs to be their right to figure it out. We yeah. men think, do not need to get in the middle of it. There's a only a handful of videos on my channel where we explore abortion. One of them is with an older woman. She was at a protest and she was against abortion, but she was also against contraception. So we explored her reasoning with that. And, and this was in the earlier, earlier days where I was still kind of learning SE. And I think at the end, she kind of stormed off. Ooh. So, yeah. So, so these are, these are even with an SE approach, you, although it was sort of a ham fisted approach at the time, you can still rub people the wrong way on, on some of these topics. Yeah, absolutely. So in all the conversations you've had, I've, I've noticed that you have spoken to plenty of people from completely different religious persuasions. What have been your experiences with the Indians who you've interviewed? And what are the variety of beliefs that they had? Give me a couple of stories if you can. Oh, well, when I was interviewing on the campus a few, you know, several years ago, I probably interviewed a dozen or two dozen Hindus. There's a couple of videos on my channel. One fellow was named Mahip. I think his name was Mahip. And I talked with him twice, although it turned out, was he Christian? No, he believed in the Hindu God. Yeah, and I think I remember listening to that one. Yeah. I think he believed in, in, in one Hindu God. And then I think he mentioned that it came down to faith for thinking that that God was real, which was a real surprise to me at the time, because I always thought, well, just Christians use the, use faith or that type of thing. Or, or I should say, I initially thought that just Christians use faith, but then when you start talking to other people, you realize that they always, that they also use faith. That was kind of, that was a fun conversation. I would love to have had a third one with him. There was another individual who came up to me who was Indian and he was just stunned that I was in the courtyard flagging people down. He's like, I can't imagine doing this. This you're so brave to do this. And he, he was just very, just a very fun interviewee. We ended up talking about reincarnation and karma, I believe, with him. Nice. And I think I ended up leaving him with some good questions to think about. Nice. So th there have been a handful of of conversations with with Hindus. I do have another video on my channel. I might even have a playlist specifically for Hindus. I'm not oh, exactly lovely. sure. I need I, I need to go through and update my channel. Yeah. But the, the the reasoning that Hindus will give for their, their for their beliefs, their God beliefs, are no different really than you would hear from a Muslim or a Christian. When you think of it from a categorical level, mm -hmm. so it's either it says so in this authoritative book, or I've had this personal experience, or I prayed and something happened. Mm -hmm. The reasoning that people give for thinking any of these gods are real are all the same, which might upset people to hear to because they think that well my my religion is so much different and but really when it comes down to the justifications for thinking of it it's all the same yeah that's that pretty much checks out because there are a lot of people in india who actually think that that hinduism is not necessarily a religion but it's a life philosophy but then other religions have also made that claim in fact there's a buddhist sect which works in india and across the world as well called soka gakai I don't know if you've encountered any of these people, but the the people that these people they actually they recruit people from all sorts of religions. And they say that you don't have to replace your religion with this. This is just a life philosophy. I'm like, what else is a religion essentially? So they have people from Sikh, Sikh people, Hindus, Muslims. They all come in and they become this very happy, happy congregation when they start chanting in Chinese. To a mahogany cabinet. I'm forgetting the name that they call it, though. Hmm. But it'll come back to me at some point of time. But yeah, that still is a religion as they have congregations, they have a place, they do the chanting, the praying, and whatever life philosophy it is, that's 
that's what it is. Even Buddhism is definitely a religion. In fact, one of the a couple of these stupas and monasteries that I've been to in uh, Ladakh, which is in far northern India, and even more recently, the key monastery in Spiti, which is in Himachal Pradesh, which is also far north in the mountains, you're not allowed to take any pictures inside because all those pictures would then be considered holy. So, but have you encountered any Buddhists though? I think I met one Buddhist, but he wouldn't talk with me or even shake my hand because he was familiar with my videos and he was, he was seemingly uneasy about me questioning his rationality. Oh, so I, there's a video on my channel. I, I think I titled it friend or foe. <laughs> <laughs> you can, you can watch it. And I, I, if I understand right, I think he was a Buddhist, but he just would never submit to an interview. So no, I, I don't think I've ever interviewed a a non-secular Buddhist. I've talked to secular Buddhists before. Interesting. That's a new mm -hmm. secular book. Buddhism is is a, is an interesting thing. Yeah, there's a whole there's a whole movement on that. Yeah, I, yeah. I was speaking to Rob Palmer just a couple of weeks back, and when he was talking about recovering from religion, so what what kind of stuff do you do there? When I first started with RFR, it was probably about nine or ten years ago. I was actually just yesterday looking to see how long I've been volunteering for them. When I initially started, I was a helpline agent. I would actually answer phone calls from 10 o'clock at night to midnight for oh, weeks wow. and and take calls for people that were having trauma from religion and helping them or guiding them to resources. And that was a real that was a real eye opener about the the pain that these beliefs cause. People are really messed up as a result of these religious beliefs. So that was a real motivating thing. But you can get burnt out doing that. I'm sure because a lot, really, it, a lot of negative with you. that you're trying to, you're trying to absorb it. You're trying to counter it. You're trying to help these people. But yeah, I don't, mm -hmm. I can't imagine that's going to be easy on the long run. Yeah. So I think I did that about a year and a half, two years. And then I switched to interviewing the helpline agents and other agents, people who want to create a support group, that type of thing. So uh, I do the intake interviews now. So if you're interested in helping a wonderful organization called Recovering from Religion and you want to be interviewed by me on the way in, sign up. They could really use your help. And it's a great organization. In fact, I think they're out now in Australia. Yeah, uh, starting, starting, Australia. Yeah, starting a whole new chapter or something out there. So yeah, it's it's so, great to see that organization grow. So at this at this meeting that I recently went to in Pune, the atheist meeting, there were several, several people who were trying to think about what exactly their role is now that they're atheists. What do we do? Like religious people are doing all sorts of things. They have certain drives and charities and they're trying to convert people or regulating things or becoming gurus and ripping people off. But what do atheists do? <laughs> like, what is it that we're supposed to do? So I was trying to tell them that secular humanism, when you're when we're talking about being secular, being secular humanists, we should be taking our activism to minimizing discrimination, improving lives of other people, promoting science communication, promoting education as a whole, especially in India. But this is a perfectly good calling as well. So if anybody is listening or watching right now who thinks that they would be really good at helping someone who is questioning their religion or coming out of it, then just sign up to RFR and see what you can do and just help out because they haven't received many calls from Hindus so far. But mm. regardless of Hindu or Muslim or Christian, I'm sure you'd be able to help out one way or the other from your perspective. Because, I mean, I started off being mostly agnostic and only religious during uh, school examinations when I'd beg God to let me pass and get good scores. But of course, nobody listened. Um, <laughs> that's what convinced me. <laughs> that was your test, huh? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. RFR, RFR is a good organization if you, if you want to commit to something like that. There are other things that you can do, though. Just Just teaching your kids to ask questions yeah. Being more skeptical is is a really good start. I ended up getting involved with a with an organization here in my city in San Antonio, Texas. And for years, we would go out and build these ramps for people who couldn't get in and out of their house. And we would meet the homeowners, we would meet the neighbors, we would meet other volunteers, and it was a really great way of of showing that hey, look at all these atheists who are out there doing some good. 
it, yeah. it helped put a face to a commonly stigmatized concept for a lot of people, at least in my area. And just normalizing atheism is huge. That's that's a great thing that you can do. So so there's lots of things you can do once you once you discard do, your religious beliefs. So do people there, I mean, I'm sure there are lots of Christians and pretty much anybody from any any religion who probably think that atheists have absolutely no morals whatsoever. Uh, so where do you think atheists get their morals from? I asked this to Seth Andrews as well. So uh, I, I listened to that interview too. Yeah, I think the the morals really just come from our society. We're, we're surrounded by the moral standards of the day and we just adopt them. They're not coming from any holy books. Yeah, uh, they're certainly not coming from a Bible. And, and thankfully they're not, because if you if you look and see what what some of the, the moral standards are in that book, they're not good. So, uh, no, humans come up with them. And generally, I think we try to avoid harm mm -hmm. and we want to encourage flourishing. That's generally what's happening. Nobody likes being in pain and we want to flourish. And that's really the genesis of our morality. That's where that's where it's coming from. It's a, it's an evolved thing over time. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you. In fact, I'm trying to put together my thoughts about this because several people who have subscribed to this channel have actually asked me and I've got lots of comments in the, the videos. So I've been kind of, I tried listening to Matt Dillahunty and it went on for about 15, 20 minutes. And by the end of it, I had zero idea what he just said because he has some very high level understanding of philosophy, which I'm afraid I don't. I kind of, I like to stick to the basics. So as much as I love and respect that guy, it was lost on me. But, but yeah, thanks for that. I think that also kind of adds to my, adds to my thoughts and my thought processes about these things, about morals, especially. So mm -hmm. what is, the, what has been the, like some of the weirdest conversations that you've ever had, like just completely out of the blue, like, oh my God, I never knew that this would, this was going to cover up. <laughs> Oh my gosh, there's so many of them. Where do I start? I've I've talked to people who, oh gosh, what do they think? One person was sure God was real because they saw, they talked to their dead dog in a dream. So that was a little unusual. Wow. I've had, I've had, I've talked to a few flat earthers, some people who think that we haven't been to the moon. Maybe the strangest one that I had was with what, what, what did you call it? There's, there's a word now I'm drawing a blank on the, on the word, but he, he was of the mindset that in, inanimate objects actually have souls, I think that cool. they're actually living. So like that rock over there is actually alive. So we explored that. What is the name of that term? I'm drawing a blank. I, I, I feel bad that I can't remember the, the, the theory. Term. No, no, because I can't the, remember. I, uh, how. The Gaia hypothesis, I think, was where the entire planet is one big living thing, one big living unit. And that might be something that might have fed into that idea. But have you no. have you spoken to any flat earthers by any chance? I, I've encountered a few flat earthers most recently on TikTok. Oh. Okay. And, and flat earthers are an interesting bunch. Uh, and f as a matter of fact, I was on this one guy. He, he, I think he's a flat earther and he is also convinced that humans haven't been to the moon. And I was on his TikTok live and, and had a chance to ask him some questions. It was funny too, because the, the, the TikTok live screwed up and he got dropped. So I was on oh. with about 600 people who were like big fans of his. Oh. And I took that opportunity to, to, to talk about the importance of, of disconfirmation that if we are evidence-based, it's important to be able to identify what evidence we would need to see to change our minds. Mm -hmm. And I, I gave a good five or 10 minute soliloquy on, on that type of thing before he rejoined the stream. Oh, so, wow. But, but yeah, all different kinds of beliefs. I mean, there was this one guy who's, who's absolutely convinced that marijuana will never be legalized in the United States. That was an interesting topic. I think we're close to legalizing that. And I'm, I am tempted to go back out to the trail to look for him to do a follow-up interview once that, once that happens. Yeah. So yeah, lots, lots of different topics, but you know, what, what we think is unusual is, is something that these other individuals, they're sure that it's true. They really, they really do believe it. So while it's tempting to kind of blow it off, I try to keep myself in a curious mindset when I'm exploring their, their reasoning, <laughs> even though I may not necessarily be convinced by it. I, when I was in, I was in Psycon in Vegas in 2018, 
And I think I went out for a movie because I was there for a couple of days extra because I wanted to just kind of explore. I went to Grand, I went to the Grand Canyon and then came back. But I went to this random cinema hall slash hotel slash casino as they usually are. But I was going to watch First Man. And it was a, that movie about the, the the first man landing it on the moon. It was Ryan Gosling about the Apollo program and the and the program that Gemini program, which preceded it. And okay. I so I went up. I was buying the tickets, and there was this guy standing next to me. He's like, "Hey, what movie are you going for?" I was like, "First Man." I was about the first land, first man on the moon. And he's like, "Oh, really? You think that really happened?" He said, well, I think so. You could join me for the movie if you want. <laughs> but he was going there to watch a different movie, unfortunately. But I hope he watched it. I don't know if it convinced him or something, convinced him or not. But there are people in India as well who still don't believe that the moon landing actually happened. Right. Yeah, it was interesting because this this fellow ended up kicking off a, a previous guest who was who is, was a retired engineer at NASA. And he was very calm and cordial. And he booted him and then he brought me on. So I was, I was a little upset that, that he had an opportunity to explore that, but didn't. That's interesting. But, yeah. yeah. They're yeah. all kind of very deeply rooted in that kind of belief system. They just want the confirmation. And how I did think that so. conversation go with him? I mean, what? It what went pretty, it, it went pretty good. I, I, I ex he, he, right before he kicked off the NASA guy, he said, oh, by the way, like, why don't they have a camera on the moon? Like, it, why, why, why is there not a live stream from the moon? Yeah. And the guy was explaining how it's technically possible, but it just, nobody's really gotten around to doing it. And then he dropped them at some point. And then when I got on, I brought up that, I brought up that example that he, that he raised. And, and this kind of gets to the what, why, how mm -hmm. it sounds like this guy would possibly find the idea that we've been to the moon if he could see a live stream from it. Right. That's sort of my sense possibly, but I didn't, I didn't take that for granted. I asked him if there was a video live streaming from the moon, would you believe it? And he said, well, no, because I've, I've seen all sorts of other videos and I can see mistakes in the videos. And that's how I know that it's all fake. And I said, okay, well, what if there was a video with no mistakes in it? Would you believe it? And he said, no. So it became evident to me and the other viewers. And then we got dropped. So I pointed this out to the audience. But basically, even if he were to see a video with no mistakes, it wouldn't change his mind. So it makes no sense to explore that reasoning with him. And... And I hope that point wasn't lost on his viewers who keep popping onto his live stream to show videos that, that are purporting that we've been to the moon. So he requires something else other than what it is he originally stated. Mm -hmm. And, and that's a really, that's a really important thing that we tend to do in street epistemology is, is find the reasoning that really impacts your confidence, because I don't want to talk about anything else. I, I want to talk about reasons that actually are moving you up or down on your scale of certainty. But in the end, it was a good conversation and he invited me back and, and yeah, maybe I'll pop on there again one day. That sounds very interesting. Speaking of which, from the time you started till now and the basic teachings of street epistemology, of course, you've put them into practice and you've refined them over time. Was there anything that you've learned through your practice and not through the books that kind of have led to a kind of a change in the way you have these conversations? Oh, yes, 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 very much so. Like a good example would be in, in the first book, Peter clearly defines what faith is. And I think go so far as to insist that this is what it means. Whereas today, an se -er, a street epistemologist, or somebody who's using SE tools may not even bring up the word faith. They might wait for their conversation partner to bring it up if it's even part of their their reasoning process. And if they do say that word faith, we would ask our conversation partner what they mean by the definition of that word. Uh -huh. So wh whereas maybe in the early days, we might foist definitions on people. We certainly don't do that today. That might be one, one example. What's another example? I mean, sharing our views in the earlier days, even on my own channel, I was hesitant to share my own position on the claim because I didn't want to influence them. Mm -hmm. I, in, 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 uh, although today, if somebody were to ask me my position, I would gladly share it because I don't want it to appear that I'm holding anything back. Of course. So even though even though I know it might actually impact rapport a little bit, if I were to tell you, well, no, I don't really think Allah is real or Vishnu is real or Jesus is real, 
that could result in a guarded conversation partner. That's probably a better thing to do as opposed to just not telling them or saying, oh, I'll do it later. I'll tell you at the end of the conversation. It's probably better to just be more upfront. So we've learned this, this has been a, a, I don't, I wish I knew the, the count of, of attempted SE conversations. It's probably <laughs> in the hundreds of thousands. And many of those, a good percentage of those are discussed in SE communities and mm -hmm. we analyze them and we do review videos of conversations and we we talk about what are the best questions to ask and the best ways to ask them and the most yeah. optimal period of the conversation to ask it. And we even, we've, we've greatly improved over the years since the origination of those books. And even since the origination of, of my videos, I look at some of my older video examples that I would say that was a prime example of SE in 2015. I think I would probably be embarrassed to post it today because we've come so far. Yeah. So it's not just from the books themselves, but it's from, from the early adopters. We've changed quite a bit. Mm. Would you, I would love it if to, uh, ad, I'm going to attach a video, like I'm going to, I'll see if I can, if with your permission, I can rip a video and then kind of add it on at the end of this podcast to kind of demonstrate everything that we've discussed and the way that you do it. Would you be able to share a video of that sort with me? I've got several just... Yeah. I'm trying to think which one might be the good. I was just looking through my video list. The, the video that I was thinking about was about panpsychism. That's the fellow who thinks that rocks were real and they have consciousness. Yeah. So that maybe I can give you that one, but there, there's a, that's not even on my top 10 playlist, to be honest. I've got, I've got a top 10 or even a top 20 of my favorite conversations. The one that you can see the technique very clearly, and you can see the end result where the person's reflecting and they're even shifting in their confidence in some cases. Mm -hmm. Those are, those are on playlists on my channel, but I'll give you the link to the to that one, if you're, if you're interested, the pants. Oh, like definitely, it. definitely. Yeah. Although maybe for your audience, maybe you want some Hindu examples. I'm not sure, but in any case, they're out there. You can, you can do a search for street epistemology and your favorite topic, and you'll more than likely find a video about it. Yeah. As somebody or the other has been doing this. So how many, how many SE practitioners are there in the community that you are a part of? And I mean, you can go to any community and take a look at the number of people in it. So I, there, there's a Facebook study group that has about 6,000 people. There's a, there's a street epistemology subreddit that has about close to 30,000 folks. The SE discord, maybe 8,000, 10,000 people. <laughs> but if you were to, like, the, the, there, there's another question, how many people are actually familiar with street epistemology and occasionally using it? Mm -hmm. My guess is it's probably close to around a hundred thousand or more. I would, I would gather. Yeah. And hopefully with this video, we're going to get some people in India to kind of give this a shot and start doing this. I would Actually, love to see somebody from from India initiating talks. And you don't have to go out on the street to initiate. I, I know you occasionally will use SE questions. And then you had another guest on your channel too, who was talking about how they, they would use Socratic questioning or, or street epistemology type of questioning. Yeah. But, but that would be amazing. In fact, we have, as the executive director of Street Epistemology International, let me just say, that we've started two committees, two groups that gather on a regular basis. One of them is for club organizers, people who want to start clubs, but there's another one for content creators. Oh. And we have individuals who are, want to go out and create SE content. And we gather on a monthly basis or so, and we get them into the room. We share ideas. We talk about equipment. What are the best locations to go? And so there's how many people show up to those? Sometimes they get a half a dozen to maybe eight, 10 people that will show up to those, those types of things and, and get advice. And that's just for the people that want to have that community. You can just start a channel and you don't have to participate in any of the SE communities if you don't want to, but why wouldn't you? Like, I wish I had these communities when I was going out and, yeah. and, and, and talking to people and, and having these challenges, recording conversations. So so what, sure the, 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 what actually the, drove you to kind of go out on the streets and talk to people? I mean, I mean, most of us would would honestly not have the balls to do that <laughs> because a lot of us are very introverted and we're kind of talking. I mean, not a lot of us, at least I, I can only speak for myself. I am very introverted. I Going out on the streets and asking people, having random conversations is something that I would find kind of hard to do myself. Um, mm -hmm. but are you more of an extrovert in that manner? What kind of drove you to go like out there and start talking to people on a, almost on a daily basis, I would say, I, or at least on a weekly basis. I would do it a lot. Yeah. I don't do it much anymore because I'm busy with the nonprofit. I'm, 
I'm more of an introvert than an extrovert. And I always have been, but there was something about, there was something about the topic, which is the God belief and the recognition of how much harm that belief in particular is causing humanity. 9-11 was, it was an inspiration. Like what, what can I do? How can we talk about these things? How can we help these people who have these views? So I think it was, it was that concern that overrode my hesitancy of going out and talking with people. And I'm, I'm glad that, I'm glad that I got over that hump because people want to talk about these things. And yes, it's unusual to go out with a camera to flag strangers down like that. That does take some guts to do, mm -hmm. but once you do a couple of them, you start to realize how fun it is, how enjoyable it is, especially when you see people thinking about a, a deeply held belief that impacts how they behave. They're pondering it maybe for the first time ever. It's it's almost like a drug to experience. <laughs> and it, it's just very edifying and motivating. And it's just amazing to see. And then they thank you for it at the end of it. That is they're, the they're not. They're not upset. They like it. And not everybody's up. Not everyone's on board with it. You get people who, once you reveal what you're doing, they don't, they don't want to participate. And they're like, ah, oh, that's just not for me. Or I'll pray for you or get behind me, Satan. I, I've even had people do <laughs> stuff like that, oh. but, but it doesn't, yeah, you, usually people were very open to the idea. They did find it unusual and it's still unusual to this day, mm. but there were no examples of people doing street epistemology anywhere when the book came out. There was just the book with a couple of paragraphs of, of conversations. And it was, it was, it was insufficient to me. I, I wanted to see, well, what, what is happening in these conversations? Do, does this technique work? And, and that's what, that's, that's what also motivated me. I was like, well, I guess I'll go out there and record some talks and see what happens. And then it kind of, it gained in popularity and, and then people from the community were giving me feedback on how to improve. And it was just, it's addicting. Absolutely. I, in fact, I, I encountered your videos first and I watched through them. And, I, and this is one of the commentary videos where you were kind of, you were out there in the corner and you kind of comment, you're giving commentary about how the conversation had gone and what you wish you had done. And I found that extremely unusual. I and mean, what is this guy talking about? Like, this is so intriguing and so weird. Like, <laughs> but I, I watched several of those videos. And I think at one point you had mentioned the a manual for creating atheists. So that's when I went and got the book and read that. Right. And so I, I actually came to the book second and I've just, I, the, the approach is so refreshing and so genuine and so appealing, not only to just to atheists, but it's just it's just a civilized way to have a conversation about genuinely exploring a person's beliefs and how they arrived at them. So if nothing else, I hope everybody watching here gives it a shot. Use these, these few tips that Anthony gave in the beginning and read the book, A Manual for Creating Atheists, and listen to his podcast and watch his YouTube channel and you will learn. <laughs> you will just absorb it all. And if you guys, if anybody here who is listening actually gets into street epistemology and starts going out in the streets and recording stuff, please, please, please let me know. Let Anthony know. He's on Twitter at Magna Bosco. What was it? On my Twitter, I think it's just Magna Bosco. But on other platforms, I think it's Magna Bosco 210. I think my YouTube channel is Magna Bosco 210. Yeah. Yeah, that would be amazing if if somebody wanted to start doing SE, whether it was in your house or on the street with strangers. By the way, we don't have a lot of, of examples of people using this approach with family and friends. I would love to see more examples of that, but whatever you're comfortable with. And there's a whole community. Of course, you've got Ab Abhijit and myself, if you want to reach out to us, but there's a whole community of people who will help you get started. And we've taken what we've learned over the years and we've boiled it down into this self-directed course. And we're looking for people to help us test these modules as they come out. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's another thing. If you want to get a sneak peek at what we're releasing, our latest and greatest information about SE, you can volunteer to help us with the course. Just go to the website and there's a page at the top, go to the street epistemology website at the top. I think it says course, mm -hmm. and you can volunteer to start testing some of these modules. Wonderful. There was an app earlier, though, that Peter had come out with. What was that called? Atheos? Atheos, yes. 
Yeah, I worked with Peter and a few other people. We put that thing together, and that took us like two and a half, three years to do. It was a major wow. project. <laughs> it's a little, I, it's a little dated now. I don't, I don't know if you've gone through it lately. I don't know if no, I'd recommend it these days. Mm -hmm. But not recently. But I, I did go through it a lot at one point of time, and I tried to get the pro version and kind of get everything offline because I can, I can do it while I'm traveling or something of that sort. But it was very interesting. And I think I got a pretty decent score on most of them. Like, I know the right things to say. The trick is to be able to say it when you're in the middle of a conversation. That's the hard part. <laughs> that, is the, that is the challenge. But if you practice, if you practice your SE and then you reflect on the conversation afterwards, and maybe even if you have the ability to record audio and share it with a friend, you're going to get better at it. And Absolutely. it just takes a little keep practice doing, in doing it back it. to yourself. Like just listening back to it yourself would, I'm sure, open up a lot of flaws or weaknesses or mm -hmm. places that you, you could have done better. I'm sure that also helps. Could you just go through those three quick steps one more time so that? Uh, yes, absolutely. So whenever you're talking with somebody and they make a claim, that's the what. That's what they think is true. So Ask them, what do you mean by that? Or how do you define that word? Or if we can quantify your confidence that that claim is true, where would you put yourself? That's sort of the what level of, of the three tiers. And the, uh, the words that need to be defined, mm -hmm. not just faith, but I, I know that there was uh, this one word which is coming up, which is truth. Truth also needs to be defined. A lot of people consider truth, personal truth, objective truth as totally different things. So that also is, is very important to kind of understand. Sorry, Kay. I'm glad you, no, 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 I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah. Faith, truth, rigged election, stolen. I think God it, is also yeah. something that a lot God of God is a good word. Yeah. yeah. Unpack those words and accept the definition that your conversation partner is using for the duration of the conversation because it's their view. So that's the first step. And then the next step, I suppose, is is why do you think that that claim is true to that degree of confidence? What's your biggest reason? And then don't just accept the first reason they give. Do that check, just like I did with that flat earther. If if there wasn't this camera, on, if there was a camera on the moon that was purportedly live streaming and there weren't any mistakes, would you still would you would you find that convincing? Mm -hmm. And his answer was no. Many times the reasons that people give for thinking that their claim is true mm -hmm. don't have any bearing on their confidence. They would still be just as sure that their claim is true if that reason wasn't there. That reveals to us both that there's probably something else propping up the belief besides that. It might be because of the good feeling that I get when I have it, or it helps me sleep at night knowing to think that I'm going to see my loved ones again or something. But to repeat that process until you identify a reason that actually impacts their confidence either up or down. It should move both ways. And then the third step of that is once you have that reason, you want to get to the epistemology or how they know what they know, or in this case, how did they determine that that reason that contributes to their confidence is of good enough quality to contribute to their confidence? What was the process that they used to validate that reason? And it's the exploration of their validation process of that reasoning that tends to help them understand that they didn't possibly do a good enough job at getting <laughs> at confirming <laughs> that that reason is is solid enough and then it has that has implications for their confidence and then just try to end it on a good note and ask them invite them to ask you similar questions in return and it's a it's a wonderful method i urge everybody to give it a shot once you've figured it out and kind of fleshed it out and kind of understood the intricacies of it watch as many videos of anthony's as you can and see, read the books if you can, but there a lot, you learn a lot from just the, the from just the videos and the podcast. I think Anthony's got a lot of episodes on the Street Epistemology podcast about how he goes through different processes, what are the things that he's learned. So I would urge you all to check it out. Anthony, thank you so much for joining me on the little interviews. This has been absolutely delightful and enlightening. And thank you Good. for everything you do. You do a fantastic job of it. And you've you've changed a lot of minds of a lot of people and helped them, first of all, learn the truth or at least come to understand their truth a little bit more deeply. And on the other hand, you've told a lot of skeptics and atheists how to talk with people who disagree with everything they believe in, not, not everything, but who definitely disagree with what they believe in. So thanks so much for joining me. 
And I'm sure we'll have you on. If anybody has questions, please put them in the comments. I will put, either put them to Anthony or you'll just have him back to answer all of them for you. That'll Thank be great. You. I'll watch I'll, I'll watch for the I'll watch for the video that you post and I'll I'll jump into the comments as well. Wonderful. Thank you so much Thank for you. having me on. And have a good week ahead. All right. Cheers. Cheers. And guys, thank you so much for watching Rationable Interviews. This has been an absolutely wonderful time. And it's been so lovely to have Anthony on to kind of learn his technique and his method of talking to people who disagree with you or people you disagree with and understanding how to get to beliefs, how to understand where beliefs come from. That is epistemology after all. So, but thank you all for joining me. Please subscribe to this channel if you want more interviews like this with people just as interesting. And we will definitely see you in the next one. If you like this conversation, give it a like, share it with people who you think might enjoy this. And I will see you in the next one. <music>